All right, so everything starts with the Big Bang, right? Yep, yep right? <laughs> Well, uh, when you think about it, uh, it's very easy to talk to some scientists and they'll tell you something crazy like, there is so many trillions of stars out inside of the middle of the universe. And you never actually think to question them. Well, how do you know there is that many stars there, right? You just accept it. But if you are walking down the steps and there's a sign saying that they've just painted the wall and clearly is wet, you still go, well, I don't know, let me see. And then you get it all over on your finger, right? How is that? Well, um, it's part of human nature. We are always questioning things. And that's sort of what makes us human in some ways, too. So uh, the thing that I want to talk about today is uh, to give you a little bit of my journey, how I came to be a college professor uh, at Santa Clara University, and walk you through some of the uh, events in my life that really got me to where I am. And uh, you know, I will share with you ups and lows, uh, things that, that guided me in, in the direction that I went, uh, which will probably be the same for many of you out there. Now, you know, if you look around, uh, you guys will be doing many different things. Things. I mean, some of my students are right now some of your teachers. Uh, and I had no idea they were going to be here, so I'm really happy to see that. Uh, and they were actually really good students, too. So you could ask them about some of uh, the classroom experience later on. Um, but some of you are going to be doctors. Some of you are going to be engineers. Some of you are going to be computer scientists, etc. My goal here is to convert you all to computer engineers. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. But incidentally, in my classes, that does happen. I have students that then are starting with bioengineering or mechanical engineering, and then they become computer engineers. So without further ado, let me go through and tell you a little bit about uh, my story. So I was born in 1984. Now, that picture is very scary, and it's uh, sort of alluding to a book that was written way back in the time, and they made movies about it, about how 1984 was going to be a really terrible time, and how all our freedoms were going to be taken away, and it was going to just be really scary. So I was born in 1984. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, there, was, there, was, uh, there was some other interesting things happening then, uh, namely that uh, cell phones had just started to be used commercially. Not by us as people, more like business people. The first version of cell phones were out and people, you know, you might see somebody carrying a giant brick with them by their ear and hey, yeah, they're screaming, I can't hear you! Yeah, well, <laughs> try it, he's over there. Um, but then uh, the internet ha wasn't really around in the shape that we recognize it now as well. So, you know, I'm not going to go through the history of the internet here, but uh, there was a method of communication where people were, were sharing files and they were sending them to other people, but there wasn't the World Wide Web. There wasn't the, uh, the browser where you could just open it up and go play a game or buy something from Amazon or any of that stuff. So when you put those two and a bunch of other things together, it becomes a question of what generation do I belong to? Um, am I part of the Generation X, which was the generation up to before technology really kicked off in the form of cell phones and, and in the form of uh, uh, internet? Or uh, am I part of the millennial generation, which is basically the generation that is the generation above you guys, uh, which sort of you know, is, is very tech savvy and they're all over the place. Um, some accounts will put me in X, some will put me in Y. Uh, incidentally, um, there's been lots of studies about that and going, oh, what happens to these individuals who are in between generations? They're not necessarily part of the core of another generation. You know, what kind of, how do they form their identity uh, and what do they do with their lives? So there's studies about that that uh, I'm not going to talk about here. But you guys are all in Generation Z, which they call the information generation. Um, why is that? What do you think? Why, why do you think that your generation is called the information generation? Over there. Well, simply because we're gathering more and more information each day about, um, say, the universe, how it's how it created, which we're getting more, becoming more accurate about the, um, about the physics of astrophysics, and um, we're just getting more and more information about ourselves, our history, our past, and, our, and possibly our future. We're just getting more and more information each day. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, and there's another hand, too. Yeah, go ahead. We have a lot 
of information. Oh, okay. We have a lot of information on our hands, and just with the click of a button, we can uh -huh. get as much information we want. Good, good. The two are excellent. Um, so you know, one that there is a lot of more information that we're producing, as the first uh, spe uh, first person said, uh, that we're producing and we're putting on the web, say in the form of Facebook, Twitter, whatever. But then also there's a lot of other information that we can get at the tip of our finger when we go to the internet. Well, how do I make lasagna? You know, you don't have to kind of ask your mom anymore how to do that. You kind of just go up and look it up, right? Um, or more important things, I'm having these symptoms. What could I, what's going on? Oh, I've got a cold, okay, you know. Um, so those are both very true. Uh, and those will, uh, those are the foundations really. We, we try to say, you hear people talking, in, especially in the museum here, you'll probably hear it too. Oh yes, we're in the information age. Eh, yes and no. We're in the foundations of the information age. We're still building the plumbing. And once we're done with that, the possibilities are going to be endless. Um, sometimes they get a little scary, you know, with the, what, what we're going to control our homes with our cell phones and, uh, you know, we can go to all kinds of different um, scenarios here. But uh, nonetheless, it's just going to get more and more interesting here on. OK, but I didn't start off wanting to be a computer engineer. As a kid, I actually wanted to be uh, a veterinarian. And I don't know how much of it was due to the movie Ace Ventura Pet Detective with Jim Carrey. Anybody seen that? Yeah, everybody's, yes, a few people. Wow, that just shows how old I am. Oh. Um, yeah, so it's a movie about this crazy guy who's a pet detective and he goes around and he's just completely insane and he's got all these animals always following him. He talks to them in different languages and, um, and I wanted to be like him, kind of, or, or maybe that was a movie about me in the future, I don't know. Um, but either way, I wanted to be uh, something like that and I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, but then I had some, you know, some realizations that there were certain things that I couldn't do. For instance, um, if an animal had been hit by the car and they brought it in and it, there was nothing I could do except to say, put it to sleep, well, I couldn't do that. I just am not capable of doing that. And that brings up an important thing. Um, when you are thinking about what you want to do in the future, you need to think about that. I'm not saying that to limit yourself. Do not limit yourself and try things out. But if you reach something that you recognize is something you're not comfortable with, like you just you know, aren't comfortable with doing a particular thing, like for instance, people who are afraid of blood or other kind of uh, scissors or stuff like that, they, don't, they should not be a surgeon, right? Um, uh, so recognize those inner voices and, and understand them and, and have a dialogue with yourself internally about those things and resolve them or accept them. You know, there's not, not always going to be a resolution to this. Sometimes it's like, yeah, I, I am not built out to do this thing. But don't let other people tell you that. Don't let them say, oh, well, uh, you know, girls aren't good at math. That's a lie. Girls are just as good as math as boys are. Uh, it's just that socially and culturally, sometimes we don't allow girls to study math as much, and we tell them to go, oh, you need to learn doing this other thing. Um, so don't let other people limit you, but recognize your own uh, internal dialogues of what you can and can't do and what you're comfortable with. So I decided, OK, I need to find something else to do. Uh, and I, I think I had a computer since I was 10. Um, there you can see that we've got the first generation computers, right? Pencil, you've got the, your copy and delete there. Um, but then, you know, we've got now a giant workstation with all these different monitors. So this is what I thought I had, but really I had something like this. Um, uh, it kind of did feel like this, but oh well. Um, so I, I started learning about computers because they were fun. Uh, we, we used to have a few computer games on there, and I could do things, and I could see the results. When I made a change, something happened, you know? Um, so, so, so I got very interested and, and, and went down the rabbit hole with it. Luckily enough, my dad had a friend who, whose son had a friend. Here, yeah, we're going. Uh, who was at the university studying computer engineering at the time, and I, you know, I was a, I don't know, I was in middle school, your age, 
Um, and so, you know, we wanted, when we had tried to set up a computer, we had gotten the help from this friend to come over and help set this computer up and various different things. And so then my dad said, hey, you know what? Why don't you teach Navid about computers a little bit? And so then we had this weekly session where he would come over to our house and he would like show me some things and teach me some things. And soon enough, I started learning a lot and I really enjoyed it. And so we became good friends. Um, sadly though, um, what happened was that he went on a vacation one day and drowned in the ocean. Um, so it was very, very um, depressing and sad, but it also taught me something very important, and that was that I needed to be self-sufficient. I couldn't just rely on this friend who could come and fix the computer every time, or he could come over and show me how to do a certain thing. I needed to learn how to do that myself. Um, so how do you do that? Well, I started taking some classes at the local community college, even though I was a high school student by that time. Um, and I got lots of certificates. This is not all the various different things. I studied, I don't know, I have 25 or something certificates. But I studied all these different things. I was taking these classes with these college kids. And they were going like, why are you in this class? I'm like, because I'm interested, you know. Um, and uh, and I, I started learning all these different things and getting certificates for them. Um, and by the time I got to college, and I went to San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton. Anybody from Stockton? No. Oh, there's just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so I went, by the time I went to community college, I sort of already knew all I wanted to know about the basics of computers. I knew how to program. I had learned how to program with QBasic, and I knew how to build a web page. I, I knew how to build a computer network. I knew all these things as a high school student. Um, so when I went to community college, the classes were very easy for me. I remember uh, the, they had this first class in computer, uh, like introduction to computer science. And OK, it was the, one of the most boring classes. Is there a question there? Oh, no, sorry. Um, yeah, there was, it was one of the most boring classes. You know why? Because they didn't even have a computer in the room for us to touch. So <laughs> it was just like, oh, hey, you know, there are these things called computers, and here's what they do. And, and I, you know, I remember the professor would say things, and I'm like, actually, that's not right. It's actually like this. And so very soon, it became very obvious that the professor, even though he was this great scientist that had worked in some labs, didn't know as much about the computers as I did. And I just some, some freshman. You know, what, what the heck? Question there? Yeah, um, didn't they have computers at MIT, but the students here have. But the students only work on the post, and they couldn't even like, use computers. Yes. So uh, that was just the first class. Then when you went to like the programming class, then of course we had labs and you could go to the computer. And you have to also remember, it wasn't, we didn't all carry cell phones with us. We didn't have laptops. Uh, the computers were kind of like the one I showed you, maybe a little more interesting, we had flat screens now. Um, but basically, generally, there were big machines, and we would have to go to a room with, there was a, called a lab, or you went home, and at home you had a desktop. So it wasn't like now where everybody just brings their laptop to class and, and you're teaching and then suddenly they're on Facebook. I mean, that's number one place where everybody is. Um, so you should ask my students if they were doing that. I, I don't think so, they were, they were pretty good. I think they both got A's, so they were good students. Um, but, but yeah, so it was different times in, in a way. Um, but anyways, then I continued on and I went to uh, all through all the various different classes, but I was bored because I, I knew all this stuff. I was really good at the math and the physics and all the different stuff I had taken these classes during high school. So I literally was taking about 21 units every quarter and then doing a bunch of other crazy things on top of it. I was part of student government. I was uh, in charge of the, uh, the clubs on campus, which were all the different student organizations. Uh, by the time I was done, I, I wasn't even looking at getting a degree from them. I just wanted to transfer to UC Berkeley, but they handed me seven associate degrees. Like, oh yeah, you've taken all these classes and matches seven degrees. I was like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> oh. um, so then I went to UC Berkeley, and in UC Berkeley, uh, I transferred in as, uh, as an EECS major. Oh, we, on the, you know, with the cool kids, we had EECS. I was like, what is that? 
EECS, electrical engineering and computer science. And so, you know, but then we say EECS and everybody's like, what, what is that, what? Um, so uh, I went there to study that and immediately something struck me. And I think this is something that maybe is a little too early for you, but, but when you're thinking of college and when you're going to college, maybe this can come in handy to you. Uh, and that is that uh, I felt at UC Berkeley that I was just another number. I was just another person with a number on my back uh, because the classroom had 500 students in it. I'm sitting back there, the professor's way down there. Um, I didn't feel that connection on, on, on the um, engineering side that I had felt in community college. So one thing that I would recommend really is if you, when you get to that age and you're thinking about college, don't rule out going to a community college or going to a smaller college. It's, it's, you know, in our society, oh, go to Berkeley, Stanford, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you probably are going to get a better experience if you don't go there as an undergrad. Maybe go there as a graduate student and, and you know, continue on on the professional degrees. But as an undergraduate, go somewhere that you will feel valued and that you will be able to be a part of that community. And, and be involved with that community and focus on what you want rather than what is the cool trend right now or what does the school doing or stuff like that. So that would be a recommendation to think about when you're starting to think about uh, college. Um, uh, anyways, uh, you know, but you know, not everything was so easy there. Uh, here's me, I was trying to dig through and find pictures. There was one where there was a circuitry that I was working in that was not working and a friend of mine just took a picture and put it on Facebook all over for a while. And everybody was like, ha ha. And I'm like, yeah, but I figured it out the minute after the picture was taken. But nobody listens anymore, right? So cyberbullying, right? Um, anyways, but now I like the picture. So I don't know. Um, then I started teaching uh, summer camps. Um, similar to a program like this. And, and you can see this is actually the History Museum uh, right here where we are. In, uh, down in the exhibitions, down there. I think this one here is where they talk about computer coding, and this one is right at the exit. Um, and there's many more pictures that I could have put, but I, but what I, part of the summer camp was I would bring the students to the computer history museum and I would show them uh, what is possible and what exists. And lots of the kids would go, "I want to be a computer engineer when I grow up," and 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 they would you know start start thinking that way. Um, and I really like this particular picture because it shows one of the speakers there. I forget his name right now. But if you get a chance, and go look at the exit section of the, uh, of the exhibition there and, and, and see the, those, those pictures, and you'll see that he says something very interesting. He says, don't let us old people get in your way of figuring out what you want to do. And, and that is very true, and that's something you can do with computers that you couldn't do. You know, back in the day, if your dad was a carpenter, you probably were going to become a carpenter. If your, your dad was a driver, you know, you'd do the same thing. But now with computers, there's endless possibilities, and you can be almost whatever you want to be with that. Okay, and then here's some of my students. They're, they're showcasing their code and programs to uh, their parents, and so we'll just go over. So then after I graduated, uh, and, and I continued to do that during the summers, I started working in Silicon Valley, where, where we are right now, right? Um, and I started working for a startup. Uh, I, you know, I don't think that that environment is necessarily for me. Like, that's one of those spots where I sort of had that internal dialogue after doing that job for a while. And I said, you know what? I don't, I don't really like this because, well, and then of course the reason was that I felt the job that I was doing there wasn't really benefiting society much. It was, it was more of, we're just building these software and we're making a lot of money for no reason. It doesn't, it's like, there's no, there's no human value being added. I don't feel like I'm giving back to my community and I don't feel part of the community because we had these crazy work hours. I'd get up in the morning before the sun went up, I'd go to Silicon, come down, drive down to Silicon Valley here, go to, go to the basement of this company and start coding. And then when the sun went down, get up and drive all the way back home. So I kind of like didn't see the sun for several, several months. Um, so, you know, that I realized early that that is not something that I wanted to do. So one day I quit my job and, and I walked out of there in the middle of the day and I had what's called a Plato's Cave moment. Now, very briefly, who's Plato? Plato's a philosopher. Oh, you, you want to say? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 
one of the great, he was one of the eight great philosophers who came up with um, this class of, I don't know whether it was like mathematical or engineering, but uh -huh. the principles that he came up with certain principles that in fact is the world we are in right now. Yep, yep. Yeah, so what he said is, is very, very true, right? Plato was a Greek philosopher, and he came up with a whole lot of things. Uh, in fact, he came up with so many different theories and ideas about things that lots of people claim that all of Western philosophy ever since him is just filling in the footnotes to all the concepts that he's sort of lined out. Now, I don't think that's actually true, but it just gives you a good picture of how much work this guy did. Um, one of the core principles for him was that he thought you can't actually do philosophy by just sitting down by yourself and thinking really hard. You have to do it with the people. You have to go and talk. It happens in dialogue. It happens when you talk to another person and you recognize what viewpoint they have and they can recognize your viewpoints and then you can come up with, with how things work. Um, so, he came up with a very interesting book called uh, Plato's Republic, and in it he has this little allegory of the cave. I'm not going to go too detailed, but the point is there are some people who are prisoners, if you may, that are born in this prison, and they can only look forward, and so behind them there is a wall, and, and then there are these people behind the wall who are holding these figures, and there's a fire which causes the shadow of these pictures to fall onto the screen. And so they are just seeing this as their entire world view. But then if we got a prisoner that sort of escapes or we let him go or something like that and he comes out, he's going to have this journey. He's going to have this sort of resistance at first. Oh, no, what is this new stuff? I don't want to see any of this. This is not good. And I'm used to the dark and all the stuff that's down there. And then as he goes out, little by little, he's going to get to see more and more. And then he's going to say, oh, I recognize maybe the shadow of this bird or its reflection in a pond because he's seen the shadow of a bird before, but then he gets to see the bird itself. And then he goes, oh, well, that's what the bird is, and so on and so forth. And so lastly, um, uh, the point is that you're going to have this kind of moment in your life. It's going to happen where you're going to say, oh, you know, I'm just really in the wrong place. Uh, how, do I, how do I get out of this? And then maybe you make a decision or something, life event occurs, and it pushes you into making that decision. Well, respect that decision and understand it and go with it because that's going to put you in a better spot. And that is what happened to me. I left that job, went to Santa Clara University, and immediately uh, enrolled in the, I was already starting to enroll in the uh, graduate program, and I started studying sustainable energy engineering, um, and I can tell you a whole lot about that, uh, but we'll bracket that for now. Um, and basically, I studied su sustainable energy engineering there, uh, which was basically an interdisciplinary degree with computers, electrical engineering, mechanical, bio, all these things all connected to one another. And as I was studying there, um, I, I started, I went to get a job on campus uh, as a graduate student assistant in the media services. And so I got the job, and incidentally, right then, they were doing something with their computer systems. They were uh, getting new servers. And I'm going, oh, this is great. What kind of features are we getting? And they go, we're just getting extra memory. And I'm going, uh, okay, well, why just extra memory? What's wrong? What's the problem? They're like, well, we've got all this data for these recordings that we do of the lectures, and they just, you know, there's just too much of them. I was like, well, why don't you go and delete the old ones or archive them, put them on tape drive, put them somewhere else, you know, whatever. Why? So they kind of tell me, oh, well, this is a very hard process, and they show me this process where they have to f use one program to identify things, to get another program. To, uh, just a very long process because the original program that they were using didn't create good naming structures for how to find the files after they've been created for each recording. So uh, I said, hmm, that's interesting. So I, I, I sat in the corner, and they were all talking, all this mumbo-jumbo, you know, getting everything ready. And I just did a little script. And I said, well, what if we did something like this? And you know, their eyeballs just went like this. And, and they go, well, uh, we hadn't thought of that. And so long story short, it, it ended up being a huge project. And I wrote this big program that did lots of archiving and lots of different stuff for them that, that, that they couldn't have imagined beforehand. Um, and my job immediately changed. I became a computer engineer at the university rather than a graduate student assistant. And uh, all kinds of different things happened. Um, 
But again, right there, computers. Because I knew how to do something with a computer in an environment that was trying to do things traditionally, I was able to think of it as, oh, there's a set of steps, an algorithm, that I can go through, or the computer can go through, that can do this job more efficiently, faster, and better than any human being can. And right there was a the solution. They saved a lot of time and money, and I got a job. So, you know. Um, so then I had enough time to go do this to my bosses, uh, you know. Yeah, that's all spider webs from Halloween. I just kind of put that there. It, it freaked him out for a second, but then he, he was fine. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then right after I graduated, they hired me to teach. They were like, well, you know, we, we like what you're doing, and uh, they, they hired me to teach. And suddenly the class that I started teaching was a class called MATLAB Programming. So one of the iterations of it, uh, lovely uh, uh, students of mine were there. And, um, uh, and that class is kind of particular because it's a class that is meant for bio and mechanical engineers. Sometimes, you know, other engineers, civil or electrical, will take it as well. But the computer engineers don't take that class because they're too busy taking other programming languages. So the computer engineering professors there don't like teaching this class. Because if they go in and they start talking about the mumbo jumbo that we know, oh yes, and this is an array, and all you need to do is you need to append this to the beginning, and then you, they lost everybody in the room. Because the students don't speak that language. They're mechanical engineers, they're bioengineers. Because I had the experience of working with, with, uh, with school kids from you know, high school and, and your age and younger, to me, that just seemed like an extension of that. Oh, you're telling me these are people who don't know anything about computer engineering but need to? I got it. And so I, would basi I basically created this mesh of these different um, classes that goes through the basics and goes into the material of the class in order to get them to be you know, up to speed on that. And so once they saw that, they were like, fine, we, we, want, we want to hire you further. And I started teaching. Um, I didn't have enough room to put everything that I do, but there are some other classes that I teach. OK. Um, another thing that I want to talk about, and I think one of the most important things is that regardless of what you end up doing, um, you basically have to take into consideration one thing called ethics. And I'm not going to go through what ethics is, but generally doing the right thing, whatever that means, right? Um, so I wear a pinky ring, and you, you'll see this, and I'll show it to you afterwards, um, uh, which basically is, is a symbol for the order of the engineer. And lots of you, if you become engineers, you'll be more than welcome to join the society uh, for uh, order of the engineer. There, it's, not a, you know, it's not a big society about, you know, we have secret meetings or anything. No, it's, there's no, no meetings, really. You just kind of get together. We get the ring. We take an oath to be ethical and do the right thing with the skills that we have learned as, computer, as any kind of engineer. Um, and the history of it comes from a bridge in Quebec that basically collapsed because the engineers did not, um, you know, do the best job. They, they kind of cut corners and didn't do the right thing. And so lots of people died. Uh, as a result of that, in Canada, they got together and they decided, okay, we're going to create little rings from the remainder of that bridge and, you know, uh, create a, sort of a Hippocratical oath like the doctors take. And then uh, it came to America, and in America, we switched it over to a stainless steel ring, and we have ceremonies. There is me giving a ring to one of my students. I think it might have even, you, you got the ring, didn't you, at one point? No, it's another one. Okay. So there's other, other students. Well, you should. Um, and yeah. Okay. Um, the things that I'm working on, and I think I'll just end with this here, is that uh, these are some of the areas that I uh, research on, and uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about if you have specific questions about these things. Automation is one that I kind of briefly touched on, like for instance, creating a program that did the work of, the, of uh, converting those files and archiving them rather than having a person do them. That's automation or part of it, and we can talk about automation uh, a lot more. Uh, another thing is uh, computer science and education. Oops, sorry, back. Uh, computer science and education, uh, and uh, what I do there is I research on seeing how classrooms are set up and how the utilization of those classrooms assists with learning, or it doesn't. Um, so that's in a very rudimentary uh, setting right now, so I don't have results to show you about that, but uh, we're studying how does the classroom set up affect the learning grades and stuff like that. 
Uh, and lastly, uh, sustainable energy, uh, you know, a, a better future for all of us who are free from fossil fuels. And I've done lots of research in that, uh, studying uh, various different biofuels, studying solar panels. I'm, and wind is one of the ones that I've really gotten into. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you want to ask me any questions about any of that, I'd be more than happy to talk about all of that stuff as well. So, on that note, I just want to say that whatever you end up doing with your life at the end, just make sure that you have an internal dialogue with yourself, and when you hit roadblocks, treat them as those Plato's cave moments that are, that are pushing you into doing something bigger and better uh, than, than you were doing before. Don't let those roadblocks prevent you from continuing to learn, from continuing to grow and continuing to be curious. And if you do that, then you're going to be able to do anything. So, any questions? All right, so we have time for some questions, so make sure you raise your hand, and one of us will come around with a microphone so we can actually hear your question. We have a question over here. What was your favorite part of college? <sighs> um, I think my favorite part of college was actually activism, as in being out there in the community of the college, meeting with other students, and, and working with the various different student organizations on campus. Because the, the aspect of studying and the textbooks and all that stuff, they're always there. It doesn't matter where you go. But there's a unique opportunity when you're at a certain place, a certain college, to connect with what's happening there on campus and around there. So those interpersonal interactions with all my peers that had vastly different perspectives on life because they were studying different things was my favorite aspect. Um, when you said you were working on sustainable energy, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, you said you were working particularly in um, renewable energy for wind. What sort of like work have you done? Like, have you changed any designs for wind turbines, for example, or something? Uh -huh. um, I have not changed any designs for for turbines, but the work that I have done has been in uh, lots of grid automation, in the sense that, for instance, uh, like one project that I worked on was we had these data sets. So we had this massive amount of data that was about the geographical locations of various different um, buildings, if you want to call them, that were using a lot of energy. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to figure out what the utilization of the energy was at any of these given locations, and, and, and if there was a certain DR event, I guess if there was an event that maybe there was a cut or something like that happened, how, how did the grid react to this? Um, and so the, the programs that I worked on was we, you know, I create a program that goes to these files, massive amount of data, gets them all, brings them out, creates visual charts of them that then we can look at, and then sort of flags at certain locations and then cross-references that with the other set of data that we have that says, okay, what were, for instance, the events that occurred in the grid at that time? And then when you put those together, now you can give an explanation, aha, this is why, for instance, this grid went down because this site started using this much energy and it pulled too much energy, so therefore we got like a shortage over here or stuff like that. So that's one of the contributions, yeah. We have a question over here. Did you yeah. Have you ever made a game? Like have made a game? I oh, absolutely. That's not me. That's oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought there's two microphones. Okay. Uh, have I ever made a game? Absolutely. Um, in fact, one of the things that I do during summers when I teach uh, computer to kids, I teach it all through computer games. Um, so we build all kinds of games. There is like, a, we use Java programming language mainly or Scratch for the younger kids um, and JavaScript in the web for the middle school. Um, uh, we made like whack-a-mole game. We built a sk screen skier game. Um, do people know what these games are? Maybe I'm too old. <laughs> yeah, whack-a-mole, you know, like you kind of hit on it. Uh, yeah, Wacom also made a computer version one where you have all these boxes and you know the picture of the mole shows up and then you gotta like click you know click real quick on it. Um, uh, there is definitely a tic-tac-toe game. Uh, 
um, I'm trying to think. There's, there's, there's a bunch of games that, that my students built that, you know, that uh, I was involved in. Like some of my students built a little battleship kind of game and car racing games uh, on a, on a two-dimensional car, car racing games. But yeah, so uh, you can ask me more about games later on too. I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. I think there's a question over here, right? Yeah. Do you have any pets? Ha, I knew it. I, I, I didn't know that somebody was going to ask that, otherwise I would have included a picture. Maybe I can send the picture over later and they can give it to you. Um, I have a leopard gecko. Yeah, yeah, right? It's a, he's a kind of like this yay big, right? Uh, he crawls all over me. And, um, it, 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 his name is Smooch. I know, right? He's just he's so cute. You know, he's like a little, a little yellow guy with like black dots on him. Yeah, you got one too? Awesome. What's yours? What's the name of your uh, gecko? Ah, oh, just gecko. Okay. <laughs> we have a question over here. Um, All right. So I'm currently building a desktop. I was like, I'm really focusing on like that architectural aspect uh -huh. of computer. So do you give like any like other speeches or like ways to contact you? Ways to contact me? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm I'm sure there is. My contact information will be available as an email or something, right? Is that? I think you'll yeah. That will disseminate that. Definitely, yeah. One more question over here? Sure. So you said before you became a computer engineer you wanted to be a veterinarian. That's right. Did you have any other dream jobs? Um, no. I, you know, I, that was really being a veterinarian, was it? Because I just love animals. You know, I've had cats and frogs and fish and birds of so many different species growing up. Um, that was it. You know, I wasn't that kid who was like, I want to be a football star, and, uh, you know, or I want to be an astronaut, or I mean, I'd like to be an astronaut. I don't, you know, still, but um, but again, it's some one of those things, right? Where it's like, oh well, can I be an astronaut? Well, maybe so, maybe not. But I'd have to have that dialogue also. Uh, but veterinarian was my absolute love. I said veterinarian because that was the closest you could get to it. You know what I mean? I just wanted to work with animals. Doesn't matter what you call it. I just wanted to be with animals all day long and play with them and, you know, but uh, so in our society we call it a veterinarian. So question there? Yeah. Or so we're going to wrap things up, but he will be staying with us throughout lunch, so I encourage you all to ask him as many questions as you can then. And he is going to be signing autographs, so make sure that he signs your T-shirt and that you get a picture with him. One last question to wrap things up. Sure. I noticed a lot throughout your talk that there was a theme of you having a sense of creativity and instilling that in all the work that you're doing. And can you just... Uh, Give the students a little bit more about the importance of being creative because I think a lot of times in the fields of STEAM, you typically forget that that aspect is incredibly important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's a very interesting question, right? Because you hear a lot of people going, oh, well, you need to really be good at, at math and physics and chemistry and all that sort of stuff. OK, well, you get really good at those things by sitting there and studying some big textbooks and doing a lot of homework and lots of math and lots of different stuff. And then when a problem is presented to you, you kind of go, well, I've done one like this before. Let me think. How did I solve this one? Oh, yes, it was this algorithm that we use or this process or this equation. But then you get a question that you've never seen before. See, if you just focused on learning the best, all those different methodologies without learning how to think about the problem on your own and making your own solution and putting together other solutions to create a better solution, well, then you're stuck. So you're not going to get the answer to this new question that you've never seen before. That is where the role of creativity comes in. You have to be able to look at things from different perspectives. Uh, one of the things that, that I did was study lots of different fields. That is a way that I was able to get that perspective. And I saw, oh, in all these different disciplines, we're talking about the same thing. But we're talking about it in different language. We're using different words. We're saying the same thing, pointing at the same object, but we're calling it something different. And so as a result of that, I could put those connections together and put myself in the shoes of the other people and how they would see that particular concept. And if you can do that, and you can all do that, it's something that you practice and learn. It's not like a, you know, something that is in your DNA. You, you can all do it. But if you do it, then creativity will come to you as second nature. 
And with that, really the possibilities are endless for you. Awesome, thank you. Let's give one big round of applause for Naveed.